Chapter 7. The Spanish Galleys The old indefatigable was lying at anchor in the Bay of Cadiz at the time when Spain made peace with France. Hornblower happened to be the midshipman of the watch, and it was he who called the attention of Lieutenant Chad to the approach of the eight-oared pinache, with the red and yellow of Spain dropping at the stern. Chad's glass made out the gleam of gold on epaulette and cocked hat, and bellowed the order for side boys and marine guard to give the traditional honours to a captain in an allied service. Pellew, hurriedly warned, was at the gangway to meet his visitor, and it was at the gangway that the entire interview took place. The Spaniard, making a low bow with his hat across his stomach, offered a sealed envelope to the Englishman. Here, Mr. Hornblower, said Pellew, holding the letter unopened. Speak French to this fellow. Ask him to come below for a glass of wine. But the Spaniard, with a further bow, declined the refreshment, and, with another bow, requested that Pellew open the letter immediately. Pellew broke the seal and read the contents, struggling with the French which he could not read to a small extent, although he could not speak it at all. He handed it to Hornblower. This means the Dagos have made peace, doesn't it? Hornblower struggled through twelve lines of compliments addressed by His Excellency, the Duke of Belchita, Grande of the First Class, with eighteen other titles ending with Captain General of Andalasia, to the most gallant ship captain, Sir Edward Pellew, Knight of the Bath. The second paragraph was short, and contained only a brief intimation of peace. The third paragraph was as long as the first, and repeated its phraseology almost word for word in a ponderous farewell. That's all, sir said Hornblower. But the Spanish captain had a verbal message with which to supplement the written one. Please tell your capitan, he said in his lisping Spanish French, that now as a neutral power, Spain must enforce her rights. Yeah, you have already been at anchor here for twenty four hours. Six hours from now, the Spaniards took a gold watch from his pocket and glanced at it. If you are within range of the batteries at Puntales, uh, there will be given orders to fire on you. Hornblower could only translate the brutal message without any attempt at softening it, and Pellew listened, white with anger despite his tan. Tell him, he began, and then mastered his rage. Damn if I'll let him see he's made me angry. He put his hat across his stomach and bowed in as faithful an imitation of the Spaniard's courtliness as he could manage, before he turned to Hornblower. Tell him I have received his message with pleasure. Tell him that I much regret the circumstances of separating him from me, and that I hope I shall always enjoy his personal friendship, whatever the relations between our countries. Tell him... Oh, you can tell him the sort of thing I want, can't you, Hornblower? Let's see him over the side with dignity. Side boys, bosun's mates, drummers! Hornblower poured out compliments to the best of his ability, and at every phrase the two captains exchanged bows. The Spaniard, withdrawing a pace at each bow, and Pellew following him up, not to be outdone in courtesy. The drums beat a ruffle, the marines presented arms, the pipes shrilled and twittered until the Spaniard's head had descended to the level of the main deck, when Pellew stiffened up, clapped his hat on his head, and swung round on his first lieutenant. Mr. Eccles, I want to be un under way within the hour, if you please. Then he stamped down below to regain his equanimity in private. Hands were aloft, loosing sail, ready to sheet home, while the clank of the capstan told other men were, were heaving the cable short, and Hornblower was standing on the portside gangway with Mr. Wales, the carpenter, looking over at the white houses of one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. I've been ashore there twice, said Wales. The wine's good, vino, they calls it, if you happen to like that kind of muck. But don't you ever try that brandy, Mr. Hornblower. Poison it is, rank poison. Hello? We're going to have an escort, I see. Two long, sharp prows had emerged from the inner bay and were pointing toward the indefatigable. Hornblower could not restrain himself from giving a cry of surprise as he followed Wales' gaze. The vessels approaching were galleys. Along each side of them, the oars were lifting and falling rhythmically, catching the sunlight as they feathered. The effect, as a hundred oars swung like one, was perfectly beautiful. Hornblower remembered a line in a Latin poet which he had translated as a schoolboy, and recalled his surprise when he discovered that, to a Roman, the white wings of a ship of war were her oars. Now the simile was plain. Even a gull in flight, which Hornblower had always looked upon until now as displaying the perfection of motion, was not more beautiful than those galleys. 
Now they lay low in the water, immensely long for their beam. Neither the sails nor the latine yards were set on the low raking masts. The bows blazed with gilding, while the waters of the bay foamed round them as they headed into the teeth of the gentle breeze with the Spanish red and gold steaming aft from the masthead. Up, forward, down went the oars, with unchanging rhythm, the blades not varying an inch in their distance apart during the whole of the stroke. From the bows of each two long guns were looked straight towards in the direction the galleys pointed. Twenty four pounders, said Wales. If they catch you in a calm, they'll knock you to pieces. Lie off in your quarter where you can't bring a gun to bear, and rake you till you strike. And then God help you. Better in a Turkish prison than a Spanish one. In a line ahead that might have been drawn with a ruler, and measured with a chain, the galleys passed close along the port side of the indefatigable, and went ahead of her. As they passed, the roll of the drum and the call of the pipes summoned the crew of the indefatigable to attention, out of compliment to the flag, and the commission pendant going by, while the galley's officers returned the salute. Don't seem right somehow, muttered Wales under his breath, to salute them like they was a frigate. Level with the indefatigable's bow bowsprit, the leader backed her starboard side oars, and spun like a top despite her length and narrow beam, across the frigate's bows. The gentle wind blew straight to the frigate from the galley, and then from her consort as the latter followed, and a foul stench came back on the air, and assailed Hornblower's nostrils, and not Hornblower's alone, clearly, for it brought forth cries of disgust from all the men on deck. They all stink like that, explained Wales. Four men to the oar and fifty oars, two hundred galley slaves, that is, all chained to their benches. When you goes aboard one of them as a slave, you're chained to your bench, and you're never unchained until they drop you over the side. Sometimes, when the hands aren't busy, they'll lows out the bilge, but that don't happen often, being dagoes and not many of them. Hornblower, as always, sought exact information. How many, Mr. Wales? Eh, thirty, maybe. Enough to hand the sails if they're making a passage, or to man the guns. They strike the yards and sails like now before they goes into action, Mr. Hornblower, said Wales, pontifical as usual, and with that slight emphasis on the Mr. inevitable when a warrant officer of sixty, with no hope of further promotion, addressed a warrant officer of eighteen, his nominal equal in rank, who might some day be an admiral. So you see how it is. With no more than thirty of a crew and two hundred slaves, they don't dare let him loose. Not ever. The galleys had turned again and were now passing down the indefatigable starboard side. The beat of the oars had slowed very noticeably, and Hornblower had ample time to observe the vessels closely, the low foxhole and high poop with the gangway connecting them along the whole length of the galley. Upon that gangway walked a man with a whip. The rowers were invisible below the bulwarks, the oars being worked through holes in the side closed, as far as Hornblower could see, with sheets of leather round the oar looms to keep out the sea. On the poop, stood two men at the tiller, and a small group of officers, their gold lace flashing in the sunshine. Save for the gold lace and the twenty-four pounder bow chasers, bow chasers, Hornblower was looking at exactly the same sort of vessel as the ancients used to fight their battles. Polybius and Thucydides wrote about galleys almost identical to these. For that matter, it was not much more than two hundred years since the last galleys had fought their last great battle at Lepanto against the Turks but those battles have been fought with hundreds of galleys aside. "'How many do they have in commission now?' asked Hornblower. "'A dozen, maybe. Not that I knows for sure, of course. Carthenga's their usual station, beyond the gut. Wales, as Hornblower understood, meant by this through the, the Strait of Gibraltar in the Mediterranean. "'Too frail for the Atlantic,' Hornblower commented. It was easy to deduce the reasons for the survival of this small number. The innate conservatism of the Spaniards would account for it to a large extent. Then there was the point that condemnation to the galleys was one way of disposing of criminals, and when all was said and done, a galley might still be useful in a calm. Merchant ships becalmed while trying to pass the Strait of Gibraltar might be snapped up by galleys pushing out from Cadiz or Carthenega, and at the very lowest estimate, there might be, employment, there might be some employment for galleys to tow vessels in and out of the harbour with, with the wind unfavorable. unfavorable. Mr. Hornblower, said Eccles, my respects to the captain, and we're ready to get under way. Hornblower dived below with this message. My compliments to Mr. Eccles, said Pellew, looking up from his desk, and I'll be on deck immediately. 
There was just enough of a southerly breeze to enable the Indy to weather the point in safely. With her anchor catted, she braced round her yards and began to steal seaward. In the disciplined stillness which prevailed, the sound of the ripple of water under her cutwater was clearly to be heard. A musical note, which told nothing in its innocence, of the savagery and danger of the world of the sea into which she was entering. Creeping along under her topsails, the indefatigable made no more than three knots, and the galleys came surging past her again, oars beating their fastest rhythm, as if the galleys were boasting of their independence of the elements. Their guilt flashed in the sun as they overtook to windward, and once again their foul stench offended the nostrils of the men of the indefatigable. I'd be much obliged if they'd keep to leeward of us, muttered Pellew, watching them through his glass. But I suppose that's not Spanish courtesy, Mr. Cutter! Sir, said the gunner, you may commence the salute. Aye, aye, sir. The forward carronade on the lee side roared out the first of its compliments, and the fort of Puntales began, began its reply. The sound of the salute rolled round the beautiful bay. Nation was speaking to nation in all courtesy. The next time we hear those guns, they'll be shotted, I fancy, said Pellew, grazing across at Puntales and the flag of Spain flying above it. Indeed, the tide of war was turning against England. Nation after nation had retired from the contest against France, some worsted by arms, and some by the diplomacy of the vigorous young republic. To any thinking mind, it was obvious that once the step from war to neutrality had been taken, the next step would be easy. From neutrality to war on the other side. Hornblower could foresee, close at hand, a time when all Europe would be arrayed in hostility to England, when she would be battling for her life against the rejuvenescent power of France and the malignity of the whole world. Set sail, please, Mr. Eccles, said Pellew. Two hundred trained pairs of legs raced aloft. Two hundred trained pairs of arms let loose the canvas, and the indefatigable doubled her speed, healing slightly to the gentle breeze. Now she was meeting the long Atlantic swell. So were the galleys, as the indefatigable overtook them. Hornblower could see the leader put her nose into a long roller, so that a cloud of spray broke over her foxhole. That was asking too much of such a frail craft. Back went one bank of oars, forward went the other. The galleys rolled hideously for a moment in the trough of the sea before they completed their turn, and headed back for the safe waters of Cadiz Bay. Someone forward in the indefatigable began to boo, and the cry was instantly taken up through the ship. A storm of boos and whistles and catcalls pursued the galleys, the men momentarily quite out of hand, whilst Pellew spluttered with rage on the quarter-deck, and the petty officers strove in vain to take the names of the offenders. It was an ominous farewell to Spain. Ominous indeed. It was not long before Captain Pellew gave the news to the ship that Spain had completed her changeover. With the treasure convoy safely in, she had declared war against England. The Revolutionary Republic had won the alliance of the most decayed monarchy in Europe. <clears throat> British resources were now stretched to the utmost. There was another thousand miles of coast to watch, another fleet to blockade, another horde of privateers to guard against, and far fewer harbours in which to take refuge, and from which to draw the fresh water and the meagre stores which enabled the hard-worked crews to remain at sea. It was then that friendship had to be cultivated with the half-savage Barbary states, and the insolence of the days and the sultans had to be tolerated so that North Africa could provide the skinny bullocks and the barley grain to feed the British garrisons in the Mediterranean, all of them beleaguered on land, and the ships which kept open the way to them. Oran, Chichuan, Algiers wallowed in unwantonly honest prosperity with the influx of British gold. It was a day of glassy calm in the Straits of Gibraltar. The sea was like a silver shield, the sky like a bowl of sapphire, with the mountains of Africa on the one hand, the mountains of Spain on the other, as dark serrations on the horizon. It was not a comfortable situation for the indefatigable, but that was not because of a blazing sun which softened the pitch in the deck seams. There is almost always a slight current setting inwards into the Mediterranean from the Atlantic, and the prevailing winds blow in the same direction. In a calm like this, 
It was not unusual for a ship to be carried far through the straits, past the rock of Gibraltar, and then to have to beat for days and even weeks to make Gibraltar Bay. So the Pelu was not unnaturally anxious about his convoy of grain ships for Oran. Gibraltar had to be revittled. Spain had already marched an army up for the siege, and he dared not risk being carried past his destination. His orders to his reluctant convoy had been enforced by flag and gun signals, for no short-handed merchant ship relished the prospect of the labour Pelu wished to be executed. The indefatigable, no less than our convoy, had lowered boats, and the helpless ships were now all in tow. That was back-breaking, exhausting labour. The men at the oars tugging and straining, drawing the oar blades through the water, while the tow lines tightened and bucked with superhuman perversity, and the ships sheared freakishly from side to side. It was less than a mile an hour that the ships made in this fashion, at the cost of the complete exhaustion of the boat's crews, but at least it postponed the time when the Gibraltar current would carry them to leeward, and similarly gave more chance for the longed-for southerly wind. Two hours of a southerly wind was all they wished for, to waft them up to the mole. Down on the Indefatigable's longboat and cutter, the men tugging at their oars were so stupefied with their toil that they did not hear the commotion in the ship. They were just tugging and straining under the pitiless sky, living through their two-hour spell of misery, but then they were roused by the voice of the captain himself, hailing them from the forecastle. Mr. Bolton! Mr. Chad! Cast off there, if you please! you better come and arm your men at once. Here come our friends from Cadiz. Back on the quarter-deck, Pelieu looked through his glass at the hazy horizon. He could make out from here by now what, they had, what had first been reported from the masthead. They're heading straight for us, he said. The two galleys were on their way from Cadiz. Presumably a fast horseman from the lookout point at Tarifa had brought them the news of this golden opportunity, of the flat calm and the scattered and helpless convoy. This was the moment for galleys to justify their continued existence. They could capture, and at least burn, the, uh, although they could not hope to carry off, the unfortunate, the unfortunate merchant ships, while the indefatigable lay helpless, hardly out of cannon range. Pelieu looked round at the two merchant ships and the three brigs. One of them was within half a mile of him, and might be covered by his gunfire, but the others, a mile and a half, two miles away, had no such protection. Pistols and cutlasses, me lads, he said to the men pouring up from overside. Clap onto that stay tackle now, smartly with that carronade, Mr. Cutler. The indefatigable had been in too many expeditions where minutes counted to waste any time over these preparations. The boat's crew seized their arms, the six-pounder carronades were lowered into the bows of the cutter and longboat, and soon the boats, crowded with armed men and provisioned against the sudden emergency, were pulling away to meet the galleys. <clears throat> what the devil do you think you're doing, Mr. Hornblower? Pelly had just caught sight of Hornblower in the act of swinging out of the jolly boat, which was, which was his special charge. He wondered what his midshipman thought he could achieve against a war galley with a twelve-foot boat and a crew of six. We can pull to one of the convoy and reinforce the crew, sir, said Hornblower. Oh, very well then, carry on. I'll trust your good sense, though, even though that's a broken reed. Good on you, sir, said Jackson ecstatically as the jolly boat shoved off from the frigate. Good on you. No one else would have thought of that. Jackson, the coxswain of the jolly boat, obviously thought that Hornblower had no intention of carrying out his suggestion to reinforce the crew of one of the merchant ships. Those stinking dagos said Stroke Orr between his teeth. Hornblower was conscious, of the, was conscious of the presence in his crew, the same feeling of violent hostility towards the Spanish galleys as he felt within himself. In a fleeting moment of analysis, he attributed it to the circumstance in which they had first made the galleys' acquaintance, as well as to the stench which the galleys trailed after them. He had never known this feeling of personal hatred before. When previously he had fought, it had been a servant of the king, not out of personal animosity. And yet here he was, gripping the tiller under the scorching sky and leaning forward in his eagerness to be at actual grips with the enemy. The longboat and the cutter had a long start of them, and even though they were manned by crews who had already served a spell at the oars, they were skimming over the water at such speed that the jolly boat, with all the advantages of the glassy smooth water, only slowly caught up to them. Overside the sea was of the bluest, deepest blue, until the oar blades churned at white. Ahead of them, 
the vessels of the convoy lay scattered where the sudden calm had caught them, and just beyond them Hornblower caught sight of the flash of oar blades as the galleys came sweeping down on their prey. Longboat and cutter were diverging in an endeavour to cover as many vessels as possible, and the gig was still far astern. There would hardly be time to board a ship, even if Hornblower should wish to. He put the tiller over to incline his course after the cutter. One of the galleys at that moment abruptly made its appearance in the gap between two of the merchant ships. Hornblower saw the cutter swing round to point her six-pounder carronade at the advancing bow bows. Pull, you men! Pull! he shrieked, mad with excitement. He could not imagine what was going to happen, but he wanted to be in the fray. That six-pounder pop gun was grossly inaccurate at any range longer than a musket shot. It would serve to hurl a mass of grape into a crowd of men, but the ball would have small effect on the strengthened bows of a war galley. Pull! shrieked Hornblower again. He was nearly up to them, wide on the cutter's quarter. The carronade boomed out. Hornblower thought he saw the splinters fly from the galley's bow, but the shot had no more effect on deterring her than a pea shooter could stop a charging bull. The galley turned a little, getting exactly into line, and then her oars beat quickened. She was coming down to ram, like the Greeks at Salamis. Pull! shrieked Hornblower. Instinctively, he gave the tiller a touch to take the jolly boat out into a flanking position. Easy! Easy! The jolly boat's oars stilled, as their way carried them past the cutter. Hornblower could see Soames standing up in the stern sheets, looking at the death which was cleaving the blue waters towards him. Bow to bow, the cutter might have stood a chance, but too late, the cutter tried to evade the blow altogether. Hornblower saw her turn, presenting her vulnerable side to the galley's stern. That was all he could see, for the next moment, the galley herself hid, him, hid from him the final act of the tragedy. The jolly boat's starboard side oars only just cleared the galley's starboard oars as she swept by. Hornblower heard a shriek and a crash, saw the galley's forward motion almost cease at the collision. He was mad with the lust of fighting, quite insane, and his mind was working with the rapidity of insanity. Give way, port! he yelled, and the jolly boat swung round under the galley's stern. Give way all! The jolly boat leaped after the galley like a terrier after a bull. Grapple them, damn you, Jackson! Grapple them! Jackson shouted an oath in reply as he leaped forward, seemingly hurdling the men at the oars without breaking their stroke. In the bows, Jackson seized the boat's grapnel on its long line and flung it hard and true. It caught somewhere in the elaborate gilt rail on the galley's quarter. Jackson hauled on the line. The oars tugged madly in the effort to carry the jolly boat up to the galley's stern. At that moment, Hornblower saw it, the sight which would long haunt his dreams. Up from under the galley's stern came the shattered forepart of the cutter, still with men clinging to it who would survive the long passage under the whole length of the galley which had overrun them. There were straining faces, empurpled faces, faces already relaxing in death. But in a moment it was past and gone, and Hornblower felt the jerk transmitted through the line in uh, line to the jolly boat as the galley leaped forward. I can't, can't hold her, shouted Jackson. Take a turn round the cleat, you fool! The galley was towing the jolly boat now, dragging her along at the end of a twenty-foot line close on her quarter, just clear of the arc of her rudder. The white water bubbled all around her. Her bows were cocked up with the strain. It was a mad moment, as though they were had harpooned a whale. Someone came running aft on the Spaniard's poop, knife in hand to cut the line. Shoot him, Jackson, damn it! shrieked Hornblower again. Jackson's pistol cracked and the Spaniard fell to the deck out of sight. A good shot. Despite his fighting madness, despite the turmoil of rushing water and glaring sun, Hornblower tried to think out his next move. Inclination and common sense alike told him that the best plan was to close with the enemy, despite the odds. Pull up to them there, he shouted. Everyone in the boat was shouting and yelling. The men in the bows of the jolly boat faced forward and took the grapnel line and began to haul in on it, but the speed of the boat through the water made any progress difficult, and after a yard or so had been gained, the difficulty became insurmountable, and for the grapnel was caught in the poop, in the poop rail ten or eleven feet above the water, and the angle of pull be pro became progressively steeper as the jolly boat neared the stern of the galley. 
The boat's bow cocked higher out of the water than ever. Belay, said Hornblower, and then, his voice rising again, Out pistols, lads! A row of four or five swarthy faces had appeared at the stern of the galley. Muskets were pointing into the jolly boat, and there was a brief but furious exchange of shots. One man fell groaning into the bottom of the jolly boat, but the row of faces disappeared. Standing up precariously in the swaying stern sheets, Hornblower could still see nothing of the galley's poop deck, save for the tops of two heads belonging, it was clear, to the men at the tiller. Reload, he said to his men, remembering by a miracle to give the order. The ramrods went down the pistol barrels. Do that carefully if you ever want to see Pompey again, said Hornblower. He was shaking with excitement, and mad with the fury of fighting, and it was an automatic, drilled part of him which was giving these level-headed orders. His higher faculties were quite n negatived by his lust for blood. He was seeing things through a pink mist. That was how he remembered it when he looked back upon it later. There was a sudden crash of glass. Someone had thrust a musket barrel through the big stern window of the galley's after cabin. Luckily, having thrust it, through he had to recover himself to take aim. An irregular volley of pistols almost coincided with the report of the musket. When the Spaniard's bullet went no went, no one knew, but the Spaniard fell back from the window. By God, that's our way! screamed Hornblower, and then, steadying himself, Reload! As the bullets were being spat into the barrel, he stood up. His unused pistols were still at his belt. His cutlass was at its side. Come aft here, he said to stroke oar. The jolly boat would stand no more weight in the bows than she had already. And you too! Hornblower poised himself on the thwarts, eyeing the grapnel line of the cabin window. Bring him after me one at a time, Jackson, he said. And then he braced himself and flung himself at the grapnel line. His feet grazed the water as the line sagged, but using all his clumsy strength, his arms carried him upwards. Here was the shattered window at his side. He swung up his feet, kicked out a big remaining piece of the pane, and then shot his feet through, and then the rest of himself. He came down on the deck of the cabin with a thud. It was dark in here compared with the blinding sun outside. As he got to his feet, he trod on something which gave out a cry of pain, the wounded Spaniard, evidently, and the hand with which he drew his cutlass was sticky with blood. Spanish blood. Rising, he hit his head with a thunderous crash on the deck beams above, for the little cabin was very low, hardly more than five feet, and so severe was the blow that his senses almost left him. But before him was the cabin door, and he reeled out through it, cutlass in hand. Over his head he heard a stamping of feet, and shots were fired behind him and above him. A further exchange, he presumed, between the jolly boat and the galley stern rail. The cabin door opened into a low half-deck, and Hornblower reeled out along it out into the sunshine again. He was on the tiny strip of main deck at the break of the poop. Before him stretched the narrow gangway between the two sets of rowers. He could look down at, the, at, at these latter, two seas, seas of bearded faces, mops of hair and lean sunburned bodies, swinging rhythmically back and forward to the beat of the oars. That was all the impression he could form of them at the moment. At the far end of the gangway, at the break of the forecastle, stood the overseer with his whip. He was shouting words in rhythmic succession to the slaves, Spanish numbers perhaps, to give them the time. There were three or four men on the forecastle, and below them the half-doors through the forecastle bulk, head bulkhead were hooked open, through which Hornblower could see the two big guns illuminated by, by the light through the portholes out of which they were run almost at the water level. The guns' crews were standing by the guns, but numerically they were far fewer, fewer than two twenty-four pounders would demand. Hornblower remembered Whale's estimate of no more than thirty to a galley's crew. The men of one gun, at least, had been called aft to defend the poop against the jolly boat's attack. A step behind him made him leap with anxiety, and he swung round with his cutlass ready to meet Jackson, stumbling out of the half-deck, cutlass in hand. Nigh on crack me not, said Jackson. He was speaking thickly like a drunken man, and his words were chorused by further shots fired from the poop at the level at the top of their heads. Oldroyd's coming next, said Jackson. Franklin's dead. On either side of them, a companion ladder mounted to the poop, de poop deck. It seemed logical, mathematical that they should each go up one by one, but Hornblower thought better of it. Come along then, he said, and headed for the starboard ladder, and with Oldroyd putting in an appearance at that moment, he yelled to him to follow. 
The hand ropes of the ladder were twisted red of twisted red and yellow cord. He could even notice that as he rushed up the ladder, pistol in hand and cutlass in the other. After the first step, his eye was above deck level. There were more than two dozen men crowded on the tiny poop, but two were lying dead, and one was groaning with his back to the rail, and two stood by the tiller. The others were looking over the rail at the jolly boat. Hornblower was still insane with fighting madness. He must have leaped up the final two or three steps with a bound like a stag's, and he was screaming like a maniac as he flung himself at the Spaniards. His pistol went off apparently without his willing it, but the face of a ma- of the man a yard away dissolved into bloody ruin, and Hornblower dropped the weapon and snatched the second, his thumb going to the hammer as he whirled his cutlass down with a th- crash on the sword, which the next Spaniard raised as a feeble guard. He struck and struck and struck with a lunatic strength. Here was Jackson beside him, shouting hoarsely and striking out right and left. Kill him! Kill him! shouted Jackson. Hornblower saw Jackson's cutlass flash down on the head of a defenceless man of a tiller. Then out of the tail of his eye, he saw another sword threaten him as he batted it with his cutlass at the man before him, but his pistol saved him as he fired off automatically again. Another pistol went off beside him. Aldroids he supposed, and then the fight on the poop was over. By what miracle of of ineptitude the Spaniards had allowed the attack to take them by surprise, Hornblower could never discover. Perhaps they were ignorant of the wounding of the man in the cabin, and relied on him to defend that route. Perhaps it had never occurred to them that three men could be so utterly desperate as to attack a dozen. Perhaps they never realised that three men had made a perilous passage of the grapnel line. Or perhaps, most probably... In the mad excitement of it all, they had simply lost their heads. For five minutes could hardly have elapsed altogether from the time the jolly boat hooked on until the poop was cleared. Two or three Spaniards ran down the companion to the main deck and forward again along along the gangway between the rows of slaves. One was caught against the rail and made a gesture of surrender, but Jackson's hand was already at his throat. Jackson was a man of immense physical strength. He beat the Spaniard back over the rail, farther and farther, and then caught him by the thigh with his other hand and heaved him over. He fell with a shriek before Hornblower could interpose. The poop deck was covered with writhing men, like the bottom of a boat filled with flapping fish. One man was getting to his knees when Jackson and Aldroyd seized him. They swung him up to toss him over the rail. Stop that, said Hornblower, and quite callously they dropped him again with a crash on the bloody planks. Jackson and Aldroyd were like drunken men, unsteady on their feet, glazed of eye, and stertorous of breath. Hornblower was just coming out of his insane fit. He stepped forward to the break of the poop, wiping the sweat out of his eyes while trying to wipe away the red mist that tinged his vision. Forward by the foxhole were gathered the rest of the Spaniards, a large group of them. As Hornblower came forward, one of them fired a musket at him, but the ball went wide. Down below him, the rowers were still swinging rhythmically forward and back, forward and back, their hairy heads and the naked bodies moving in time to that of the oars, in time to the voice of the overseer too, for the latter was still standing on the gangway. The rest of the Spanish were clustered behind him, calling the time. Says, Sate! Oco! Stop! bellowed Hornblower. He walked to the starboard side to be in full view of the starboard side rowers, He held up his hand and bellowed again. A hairy face or two was raised, but the oars still swung. Uno, dos, tres, said the overseer. Jackson appeared at Hornblower's elbow and levelled the pistol to shoot the nearest rower. Oh, belay that, said Hornblower testily. He knew he was sick of killings now. Find my pistols and reload them. He stood at the top of the companion like a man in a dream, in a nightmare. The galley slaves went on swinging and pulling. His dozen enemies were still clustered at the break of the foxhole thirty yards away, while behind him the wounded Spaniards groaned away their lives. Another appeal to the rowers was much ignored, as the preceding ones. Aldroyd must have had the clearest head or had recovered himself the quickest. I'll hold down the colour, shall I, sir? He said. Hornblower awoke from his dream. On a staff above the taffrail fluttered the yellow and red. Yes, hold him down at once he said. Now that his mind was clear, and his horizon was no longer bounded by the narrow limits of the galley, he looked about him, over the blue, blue sea. There were the merchant ships, 
Over there lay the indefatigable. Behind him boiled the white wake of the galley, a curved wake. Not until that moment did he realise he was in control of the tiller, and that for the last three minutes the galley had been cutting over the blue seas unsteered. Take the tiller, old droid, he ordered. Was that a galley disappearing into the hazy distance? It must be. And far in its wake was the longboat, and there, on the port bow, was the gig, resting on her oars. Hornblower could see little figures standing in the bow and uh, waving in the bow and stern, and it dawned upon him that this was in acknowledgement of the hauling down of the Spanish colours. <clears throat> Another musket banged off forward, and the rail close at his hip was struck with a tremendous blow which sent gilded splinters flying in the sunlight. But he had all his wits about him again, and he ran back over the dying men. At the after end of the poop, he was out of sight of the gangway and safe from shot. He could still see the gig on the port bow. Starboard your helm, old droid. The galley turned slowly. Her narrow length made her unhandy if the rudder was not assisted by the oars. But soon, the bow was about to obscure the gig. Midships! Amazing that there, leaping in the white water that boiled under the galley's stern, was the jolly boat, with one live man and two dead men still aboard. Where are the others, Bromley? yelled Jackson. Bromley pointed overside. They had been shot from the taffrail at the moment that Hornblower and the others were preparing to attack the poop. Then why in the hell don't you come aboard? Bromley took hold of his left arm with his right. The limb was clearly useless. There was no reinforcement to be obtained here, and yet full possession must be taken of the galley. Otherwise, it was even conceivable, conceivable that they'd be carried off into Al Algeciras. Even if they were masters of the rudder, the man who controlled the oars dictated the course of the ship, if he willed. There was only one course left to try. Now that his fighting madness had ebbed away, Hornblower was in a sombre mood. He did not care what happened to him. Hope and fear alike deserted him, along with his previous exalted condition. It might be resignation that possessed him now. His mind, still calculating, told him that the only one thing left to do to achieve victory he must attempt it, and the flat, dead condition of his spirits enabled him to allow it to carry the attempt through like an automaton, unwavering and emotionless. He walked forward to the poop rail again. The Spaniards were still clustered at the far end of the gangway, with the oversteer still giving the time to the oars. He looked up at him as he stood there. With the utmost care and attention, he sheathed his cutlass, which he had held in his hand up until that moment. He noticed the blood on his coat and on his hands as he did so. Slowly, he settled the sheathed weapon at his side. My pistols, Jackson, he said. Jackson handed him the pistols, and with the same callous care he thrust them into his belt. He turned back to Aldroyd, the Spaniards watching every movement with fascination. Stay by the tiller, Aldroyd. Jackson, follow me. Do nothing without my orders. With the sun pouring down on his face, he strode down the companion ladder, walked to the gangway, and approached the Spaniards along it. On either side of him, the hairy heads and naked bodies of the galley slaves still sl swung with the oars. He neared the Spaniards. Swords and muskets and pistols were handled nervously, but every eye was on his face. Behind him, Jackson coughed. Two yards only from the group, Hornblower halted and swept them with his glance. And then, with a gesture, he indicated the whole group except the overseer, and then pointed to the foxhole. Get forward, all of you, he said. They stood staring at him, although they must have understood the gesture. Get forward, said Hornblower, with a wave of his hand and a tap of his foot on the gangway. There only seemed one man there was only one man who seemed likely to demur actively, and Hornblower had it in mind to snap the pistol from his belt and shoot him on the spot. But the pistol might misfire. The shot might arouse the Spaniards out of their fascinated dream. He stared the man down. Get forward, I say They began to move. They began to shamble off. <clears throat> Hornblower watched them go. Now his emotions were returning to him, and his heart was thumping madly in his chest so that it was hard to control himself. Yet he must not be precipitate. He had to wait until the others were well clear before he could address himself to the overseer. Stop those men, he said. He glared into the overseer's eyes while pointing to the oarsman. The overseer's lips moved, but he made no sound. Stop them, said Hornblower and this time he put his hand to the butt of his pistol. That sufficed. The overseer raised his voice in a high-pitched order, and the oars instantly ceased. 
Strange what sudden stillness possessed the ship with the cessation of the grinding of the oars in the folds. Now it was easy to hear the bubbling of the water round the galley as her way carried her forward. Hornblower turned back to hail Oldroyd. Oldroyd, where weighs the gig? Close on the starboard bow, sir. How close? Two cable length, sir. She's pulling for us now. Steer, f- steer for her while you've steerage way. Aye, aye, sir. How long would it take the gig under oars to cover a quarter of a mile? Hornblower feared anticlimax, feared a sudden revulsion of feeling amongst the Spaniards at this late moment. Mere waiting might occasion it, and he must not stand idly by. He could still hear the motion of the galley through the water, and he turned to Jackson. This ship carries away well, Jackson, doesn't she? he said, and he made himself laugh as he spoke, as if everything in the world was a matter of sublime certainty. Ah, sir, I suppose she does, sir said the startled Jackson. He was fidgeting nervously with his pistols. And look at the man there, went on Hornblower, pointing to a galley slave. Do you ever see such a beard in all your life? N- no, sir. Speak to me, you fool. Talk naturally. I I don't know what to say, sir. Oh, you've no sense, damn you, Jackson. See the welt on that fellow's shoulder. He must have caught it from the overseer's whip not so long ago. Maybe you're right, sir. Hornblower was repressing his impatience and was about to make another speech when he heard a rasping thump alongside, and a moment later, the gig's crew was poring over the bulwarks. The relief was inexpressible. Hornblower was about to relax completely when he remembered appearances. He stiffened himself up. Glad to see you aboard, sir, he said, as Lieutenant Chad swung his legs over and dropped to the main deck at the break of the forecastle. Glad to see you, said Chad, looking about him curiously. These men forward are prisoners, sir, said Hornblower. It might be well to secure them. I think that's all that remains to be done. Now he could not relax. It seemed to him as if he must remain strained and tense forever. Strained and yet stupid, even when he had heard the cheers of the hands of the indefatigable as the galley came alongside her. Stupid and dull, making a stumbling report to Captain Pellew, forcing himself to remember to commend the bravery of Jackson and Aldroyd in the highest terms. The Admiral, the Admiral will be pleased, said Pellew, looking at Hornblower keenly. I'm glad, sir, Hornblower heard himself say. Now that we've lost poor Soames, went on Pellew, we shall need another watch-keeping officer. I have it in mind to give you an order as acting lieutenant. Thank you, sir, said Hornblower, still stupid. Soames had been a grey-haired officer of vast experience. He had sailed the seven seas, he had fought in a score of actions, but... Faced with a new situation, he had not the quickness of the thought to keep his boat from under the ram of the galley. Soames was dead, and acting Lieutenant Hornblower would take his place. Fighting madness, sheer insanity, had won him this promise of promotion. Hornblower had never realised the black depths of lunacy into which he could sink. Like Soames, like all the rest of the crew of the Indefatigable, he had allowed himself to be carried away by his blind hatred for the galleys, and only good fortune had allowed him to live through it. That was something worth remembering.